Welcome, uh, Health Impact audience. Uh, you know, that was a great, uh, for those of us who are join, uh, able to join us uh, with uh, Aaron and Sarah's uh, talk, we learned a lot about uh, business models. What are the major threats um, to the existing uh, business models and how you can use uh, modern disciplined uh, innovation approaches to really look for brand new things that you weren't doing before. And that's why this next uh, session that we're going to go into, which uh, uh, Michael, from uh, who's a senior director at the Health for Healthcare and Life Sciences at SADA, um, is going to be leading around AI for cutting edge clinical care. And what we want to do in this session is really talk about not the highfalutin, like kind of like uh, hand and arm waving about AI is cool and machine learning is cool, but what the heck is it doing really today to change clinical care, hopefully for either just increased quality or we get increased quality uh, at a much lower cost and much higher safety. And so with that, I'd love to uh, hand this over to Michael, who's going to help introduce the uh, panelists, take over from there, and he'll let you know uh, how he'll be taking questions as well. Michael, take it over. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Shahid. And great to be here with everybody. Um, you know, it's it's Friday afternoon, I know, for a lot of you. Friday morning for some of us and lunchtime for others of us. There are a lot of reasons why the energy level might be fading today to say nothing of distractions in the news. So what I'm happy about is to have a topic here that I've been really, really excited about um, since, it, since it first came to mind, uh, bringing together three panelists who I've been fortunate in my career the last few years to be able to interact with really in all three cases, really just small ways and, and, and to have gotten a little bit of insight into some of the exciting and innovative things that they're doing. And they are all three working in areas that when I think about it, I think, okay, 2020 aside, there may actually be hope for our future, right? And there may be ways in which all this technology and all these things that we're pushing through are going to help change people's lives for the better. So i um, thrilled to, to be able to introduce our panelists. We have Mike Rosenberg from the Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine, and he'll tell you more about the work that he is doing in individualized medicine. David Wang from uh, BioIntellisense, who's doing some really exciting work in IoT and biosensors. Riley Ennis from, uh, from Freenome, who is uh, working on innovative approaches for testing in the um, in the uh, colorectal cancers and other spaces. And, and that, that's all I'm going to say because I'm gonna let them go deeper, okay? So our format here, I'm gonna give each of them a chance to talk a little bit about themselves, the, the, the products that they are working on. And we're gonna delve into topics about how they're using artificial intelligence technologies to enable the stuff that they're doing, right? Really get at what is made possible today that wouldn't have been possible before the advent of machine learning and these big computational capabilities that we have now that we did not have before. Um, and, uh, and then some questions drilling into how those are uh, potentially or currently affecting patients and patients' care and, um, and their, their learnings and experiences and what we might be expecting in the future. We would love to collect your questions as we go in the Q&A box on the bottom right of the screen. And if you'll, if you'll plug them into there, then to the extent that I can weave those into the conversation and answer them as we go, we'll do that. If not, if anything is unanswered, we're going to leave about 10, 15 minutes at the end and we'll hit up those questions in, in order as we get them. All right. So um, the first question for all three of you, just take a moment to introduce yourself. We want to hear about your company, your role in that company, what your product or service is, and setting aside how it's built, how, how is it that it is actually going to transform, make a difference in the lives of patients and, and clinical care? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, my name is David Wet. I'm the co-founder and chief technology officer for BioIntelliSense. And, and yeah, so basically, at the highest level, I've been doing wearables for about 10 years, uh, co-founder and founding CEO of Strive, uh, which is kind of a wannabe Fitbit, made a couple million wristbands for healthcare, looking at optical heart rate, a lot of the sensing pieces. Uh, about 2018, um, kind of came together with BioIntelliSense, and the idea was already saying like, wow, your body's giving up all this data. If we can kind of like passively, frictionlessly capture it, that'd be great. Problem with the wristband, uh, we know this quite well, is like, similar to real estate um, sensors and the quality of your signal, it's all about location, location, location. So if you wanna look at 
core body temperature, breathing, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the wrist has a, it's a lot of noise. So we came out with one of these guys um, and one of these guys. And so these are little like disposable, we call it bio button and a bio sticker. You stick it on. It's a multi-parameter kind of multi-sensor passively sucking in all this data, doing some intelligence here, and then shooting over the cloud and stitching a bunch more data together. Um, not just your physiological par parametric or parameters, um, also, you know, kind of IDC 10 diagnostic stuff, um, a whole bunch of other pieces and trying to think through, hmm, you know, what are early issues before you're even aware of them? And of course, COVID is a perfect example of like, can we um, screen slash diagnose COVID prior to any onset of overt symptoms? Um, can we look at congestive heart failure? Can we look at all classes of diseases? And that's essentially the founding thesis is that this data is coming off your body all the time. Can we capture it? Can we analyze it? And can we intervene far sooner, far earlier um, than you would otherwise know about or a doctor's visit would necessarily even show? So that's essentially the, uh, what we've been doing. I'm a, actually a clinical cardiologist um, and really have sort of used, fallen into use of machine learning and things um, coming from more of a stats kind of epidemiology background. and. Most of my focus really has been on using it for clinical decision support. And we sort of do that on two frameworks. One is on the provider side, which is getting information in front of a provider that you would want to know if you were seeing a patient. And most of that's predictive analytics. And then the flip side is also um, the patient side, which is sort of getting data in front of patients that might summarize some of their health information and maybe lead them in certain directions as far as a care decision. So I should mention that none of these are products that's research <laughs> entirely, um, but uh, hopefully at some point, you know, we'll um, get something out there. Great, thank you, Mike. Riley, your turn. Great. So I'm one of the co-founders and chief operating officer at Freenome, and we're primarily focused on preventing and improving how we diagnose and intervene earlier for, for cancer. And our first use case is in colorectal cancer, where unfortunately, even before COVID, 50 million people in the US were not getting their colonoscopy, not getting a stool-based test. And the opportunity to use a non-invasive um, blood draw, just standard blood draw as part of an annual physical, um, we're looking at DNA, RNA, and protein, which we call our multi-omics platform. And we're using machine learning both in the discovery process to identify the most informative markers, and in fact, we stumbled upon uh, when we did kind of this agnostic discovery that the immune system uh, sends off this smoke signal pretty early on um, in the disease process that we can pick up through the standard blood draw. And the beauty of that is if we can combine the immune derived signatures with this multi omics platform, um, we know the immune system is involved in many different diseases. So it's an opportunity to generalize this framework into other cancers and, and go beyond that. Um, so we primarily look at this as a focused application with a generalizable platform. Um, and machine learning has played an important role, uh, but it's been very difficult uh, for us, I think, to get to a position of making that impact. And we're currently working through our FDA pivotal study, um, which will be happening over the coming years. And that will then lead to the launch of our colorectal cancer test. Great. Those are those are great introductions. And what I want to highlight here as the common thread and and really the the thing that that when we were putting this panel together it drove me to reach out to to the three of you is that you are all doing things that ultimately can have a significant impact in the way that we care for patients, right? So, so um, David, in a minute, I want you to talk talk more about you know all of the sort of phenotypic insights that you're able to extrapolate from this sensor that somebody's wearing on a on their chest. Riley, I can't tell you how excited people get about the concept of a of a blood draw that might possibly reduce your odds of having to go get an actual colonoscopy, right? That's that's min that's that's almost trivializing what you're doing, but that's it's significant to a lot of us and what you're doing goes way beyond that. And, and Mike, you know, um, I remember conversations a year and a half ago with you having to explain to me in very small words what the difference is between individualized medicine and personalized medicine and how important those differences are. So we're really talking about technologies that actually can, can change the way that we care for patients and, and then honing in specifically on, uh, on AI on, and machine learning. So, so now what I wanna do is go back to Mike. We're gonna go back to our original order here. And, and we, can you go into a little bit about that individualized medicine versus personalized medicine concept and why it, it, why it is that you need machine learning to do what you're doing there? Sure, sure. And um, 
I, I spent 16 years on the East Coast, so I appreciate the importance of semantics, although I can't say I ascribe a huge importance to which term you use, for which, which version. But uh, I think, so for me, when I think of individualized medicine is sort of, um, I think what David's describing, where you're sort of um, kind of quantifying an individual's data and using that to draw inferences about a single um, single trait, single disease state, um, li liability models, you know, different ways to, to actually measure health um, using obviously now sensors and more advanced technologies, but even going back to like blood pressures and lab draws, the things we would do, um, it, you know, yeah, continue, you know, previously um, for patients. And then, you know, then personalized medicine, again, being, you know, coming up with ways to predict, to, to develop a prediction model for a specific person based on genetic data, based on all the different type of information that you can collect. Um, I would say like most people, I'm limited by, you know, sort of like the, um, the, the story of the drunk looking for his keys under the lamp. Um, I use the data that's available to me. Um, EHR data is very cheap, very easy to get your hands on. Uh, it's extremely low quality and we all kind of know that, but it's very usable. Um, I think a lot of the work we've been doing is ways to start with a framework from something where you have a lot of data like that and then to build in through using sort of different machine learning approaches, um, genetic data or EKG data or stuff that you may not have on everyone, but that, you know, in, in theory could map within that, um, you know, bigger framework of, of what it is, of sort of the virtual patient, if you will. So, so when, you know, when the results of your research are sort of productionalized or, or able to be implemented inside a, a clinic, give, give Give us an example of, of how that patient or, or provider experience is different. What actually changes when that is done? Oh, no. We froze on him again. All right. <laughs> We're going to come back to Mike again in a minute. Believe me, I, I, we all feel the pain of sharing sharing the Wi-Fi with our yeah. kids and family members at home. So it could, could be any of us at any moment. All right, David. So, so to you. Go into yeah. a little bit more detail. How is AI ML important and enabling for the for the product that you're building? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so Bio is like my fourth startup. The first one back in 2002. Can you believe that? We were developing one of the earliest. You know, from a Garmin and TomTom Tom GPS on the windshield. Remember those things in 2004? Super popular, right? We were the leading provider of all that silicon. And the algorithms to do GPS, you have a lot of signal processing. You start putting an inertial navigation with a compass, right? So that's old school sensor fusion. And when we looked at building that, it was all like physics and math equations, MATLAB, and trying to do these models with people scratching their heads, right? And then now you fast forward 18 years, and it's like, okay, I want to basically discern if you have, you know, X, Y, or Z disease states among 17 interacting parameters. It's just out of you just can't do it with algorithm tuning and we, we tried um and so what what's profoundly changed our view and our ability is just what we're seeing across the board across every industry which is machine learning ai and using that at scale it's basically allowing us to hit rock curves and you know accuracy scores that uh you could only dream of before um and so so i think like it really then kind of changes the conversation where it's really almost not even so much about the model, but really it's about how do you acquire that data? How do you clean it? How do you annotate it? Um, and, and just get to scale. And so, um, you know, some of the stuff we're seeing across the board that we're actually working with multiple partners on is just, yeah, like I said, it's just uh, pretty, pretty incredible. Um, and then that helps us inform, you know, what's the next set of little sensors you want to stick in the next generation widget. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 um, it's, completely shifted all of our value proposition um, to to really think through these kinds of screening diagnostics that we couldn't do before. Sure, and so back to that sort of similar question of how does it actually change things? I think we can all maybe get our heads around the idea of artificial intelligence in a self-driving vehicle, right? And we've trained it through millions of hours of simulations to recognize that this kind of shape moving like that might be a pedestrian in the street, and so slow down and make sure that you don't hit them. Yep. What is it that the AI inside the biointelligence sensors is actually doing? Yeah, yeah. So for for sure. So you have an accelerometer right in here, and accelerometers have been used for step counting forever. But once you put it here, right, when you cough, when you talk, when you vibrate, all these subtle signals can come in. The acoustic sensors, right, we're looking at coughing, vomiting, sneezing, now saying is it a wet cough or dry cough, right? Those types of uh, classifiers are are totally um yeah totally important and also 
much more subtle. And the ability to squeeze squeeze the payload down so you can send it up and still have one of these things last for a couple of months on a single battery um, is, is really tough. And so when we think about something like COVID, where it's multi-parameter, right? You look at respiratory rate, heart rate, breathing, motion, fatigue, myalgia, right? All those things coming together um, and then writing the right feature extraction then feeding into the models. Um, it's just basically using a couple core sensors here with the right types of you know features. And then you just see those predictor values. And um, that's kind of like specifically how we're doing it, right? We are FDA clear for heart rate, respiration rate, temperature. But we also have additional features like your gait, your body position, your movement, uh, coughing, sneezing, you know, all that kind of other stuff. And that tapestry, that kind of landscape of signal all feeds in to what we call a SAMDA, a software as a medical device. So it's basically an FDA approved algorithm, so to speak, or a machine learning model that gets or a function that gets exported um, to essentially screen or diagnose ABC. Um, and so this is just squarely in what we're doing. Um, and like I said before, sensors is important. It really gives you that individualized lens, but then again, augmenting other pieces, things like we found even zip code, ambient temperature of the zip code, like other things are all really interesting when you start looking at confidence scores. So, so uh, yeah, there's a lot of super, super fun time. I don't know, it's, um, but we're having a blast. Yeah, I mean, what I love is the idea of, of you've got you know a small a small sensor and really you know it only senses a handful of things right and from that handful of things you're able to develop and train models that then tell you things that are really useful like this person is coughing this person has a dry cough this person right. just tripped and fell right so so extracting entire phenotypes from a two inch square on your chest I think is remarkable and it's hard to imagine like how we could have done that in the pre in the pre AI world. Yeah, I'll give you another example. Let's talk about fever, right? And the classic clinical definition is, you know, oral thermometer, 100.4 degrees, right? Very simple. And, and what we're finding is like, wow, you know, that's, that's easy enough, but someone's got to, you know, put a thermometer inside two times a day versus just stick this on and don't think about it. But when you're on the skin and on the wrist, right? You know, you go inside, go outside, air conditioning, all this crazy stuff, right? There's noise everywhere. But then at the same time, you're not taking two measurements a day. You're taking 10,000 measurements a day. Mm -hmm. So it's a super interesting kind of like remapping of how you do data acquisition and using machine learning, but then having reams and reams more data that allows this kind of data acquisition to be frictionless, right? That's the key, I think. What what you know what Riley's doing is incredible as well, right? Just like blood, you know, and then just running that through, just taking that barrier all the way down and pushing the predictive, you know, uh, insight forward, right? I, I think that combination, that's the future. So uh, super yeah. exciting. Yeah, that is exciting. And you say it's the future, but but this is something that you know biointelligence has has yeah. moving right now. Uh, right. Um, Riley, just since your name came up, um, why don't you jump in? Here's that that same answer. So. Uh, how is it very specifically that, that AI comes into play in the work that, that you're doing and, and how, is it, how does it actually you know, change what the, the patient care experience ends up looking like? Yeah, no, and I think for us, we're, we're taking kind of a different approach and I'll come back to the replacement colonoscopy that actually we don't want to replace colonoscopy. Okay. Um, if everyone actually got their colonoscopies, then we wouldn't have this problem. Um, and I share that because I think we've, because we're, we're, you know, we're submitting uh, what's called a PMA, so it's more of a higher bar for an FDA submission, but given the complexity of multiomics, of looking at you know, DNA, RNA, and protein from blood, it's actually very difficult from all the data pipelines and the versioning of classifiers, and the FDA is still moving their way for PMAs uh, with respect to uh, machine learning. Um, so for us, it's, it's actually finding and understanding our problem and all the touch points in which current care is being delivered and where a human in the loop solution it's not just the blood test that more holistically people see freenome as enabling current practices of medicine as more of working with the system to build towards change. And I think that philosophically is really how freenome we've really approached this problem. And with machine learning specifically, um, what we started to see is when you start thinking about caloric cancer screening, the first step is people turn a specific age and then they are reminded by their physician or they know that they should get screened. Unfortunately, there are people who are now younger getting diagnosed. We're seeing unfortunate, very tragic deaths like with Chadwick Boseman, where somebody way outside of the guidelines got diagnosed and passed mm -hmm. away from colorectal cancer, which is completely preventable. So a lot of the, the payers and providers are looking for solutions, not a blood test, but they're looking for ways in which they can figure out who needs to get screened, who's up to date on their screening, and can we provide both software and machine learning that can help just triage these are people who should get a colonoscopy, and now they know who to prioritize and reach out to. 
So that's a first step in the workflow where today people do that, but it's mostly from calling people, from just downloading lists of names and reaching out to people who are a specific age um, versus understanding some of the explainability behind these models of why might somebody a specific risk factor, should they really, really get screened, which might actually incentivize them to come in and get a colonoscopy. So that's one touch point kind of outside of the blood test that we're seeing machine learning play an important role to fit into that current care pathway and just augment what people are already doing. And that really builds trust with the system. It builds demonstration cases that when we have the blood test, which is machine learning enabled as well, it starts to fit into this overall story and narrative around what's possible. Um, and the, the big one of machine learning for us really is on that blood test, but it, it's not just in how we classify cancer versus healthy. It is in how we featureize the data, is in how we look at quality control of our data, how we can normalize, how we handle missing data. Um, it's how we think about adding additional analytes and different blood me measurements over time. It's how we incorporate the clinical risk priors from the EHR data into the multi classifier and bring more of a multimodal approach. Um, it's how we can report and stream and look at transactions within our models based on outcome data. So feedback from real world data, uh, when we were correct or incorrect in our model, and can we use that to inform feature architectures or just uh, additional trainings of, of, of our models? So we really think about this holistically, and that's why we're so focused on just colorectal cancer because there's so many touch points and complexity uh, right. within the healthcare system um, that we've wanted to take more of this holistic approach and machine learning is just one of the tools. You don't, you don't need machine learning for a lot of these aspects. Um, and we always show more of a traditional approach next to machine learning. And sometimes it works well and outperforms, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I think that level of honesty and transparency is critical, um, especially in the healthcare space when the, I mean, this is people's lives. So we have to be as transparent as possible. Riley, on that topic, and, and, and you mentioned explainability um, earlier on, there's a component of what you're doing, if I'm understanding right, that's diagnostic in, in nature. Um, is that a problem that you have had to deal with? Because one, one of the concerns about machine learning is you may get a highly predictive model, but you may not be able to explain why it works or give a biomolecular justification for, for whatever is being uh, uh, found through this diagnostic um, uh, model that you've created. Is that lack of explainability a concern or something that you've had to face and try to address within Freenome? Yeah, so on the clinical metadata side, it's a little easier um, because as long as some of the, the risk factors being identified are falling within the guidelines, it's something that can be easily tested by the physician. They know that, for example, diabetes has some association with increased risk for colorectal cancer. So if they see that somebody who has diabetes is being called out in the model, that they really should get their colonoscopy, that's something that fits within kind of the current paradigm of, of those risk frameworks. Got and then it's on publishing on any additional risk factors. Um, and on the blood test side, it really is how you structure the features. If you make your features more interpretable and you find a ways of extracting based on which features are being more informative versus less, there's an element of explainability and then it becomes in how you communicate that into different audiences. Um, so I think it's something that it's a little harder in the blood test, but it is possible. Um, something that's critical for FDA, critical for several stakeholders. I, and I feel like this is an area where healthcare has a bigger challenge here because people are rightfully sensitive and concerned about what decisions are being made about them and their health and their body and they always want to know why. Doctor, why is this? Help me understand how does A get to B? Um, and so I, I think I understand what you're saying there in terms of the clinical metadata. You're able to refine uh, analysis of the metadata in order to make a prediction, but using metadata that is itself part of standard of care or close to a standard of care for those diagnostics. And so maybe we get better at understanding the appropriate ranges and how they interact with each other, but underneath it, it's the same basic inputs that are gonna to lead to the output. You're just bringing another level of refinement to that. So in the end, the doctor can look at the patient and say, this is what we're seeing and, and this is why, this is why it's justified. Okay. Yep, exactly. Mike, good to have you back <laughs> Yeah. We <laughs> tried. We're glad you're here. I'm afraid to and talk. I'm afraid to talk. It's a great discussion. I don't want to like miss out here if I start we're, talking. <laughs> we're trying to change lives and, and save the world here and maybe we just need to get you better Wi-Fi. Like, yeah. There's an easy problem we can all tackle together. <laughs> really, really sorry, man, but we do all understand sharing Wi-Fi with kids. So you're fine. You're in good shape. I want to go back with you back to how do I, as a patient, 
um, how has my life changed or improved through the, the ML-based work that you're doing and an individualized medicine approach versus things that are happening more commonly now? Sure, um, sure. And I and I actually can talk a little bit to what you were just talking about also with the transparency, because yeah. actually I, I think you'll find that there is a, a huge space to, to or, you know, area to cross between what physicians use now for evidence base and sort of inference and the level of sort of granular you get with the um, machine learning or any kind of advanced analytics. Um, but I think that to, to come back to what we're doing, so on the patient level, you know, again, it's it's a little bit about um, just sort of um, giving, you know, for individual patients and sort of presenting their own information to them in a quantitative uh, manner. Um, the example I give you is, let's say you're treating someone with migraine headaches and you'll try a new medication out and the current workflow is they come back to clinic in you know, three to six months. And it's kind of this general question, you know, how's it going? And it's this kind of broad non-quantitative assessment, which, you know, some, you know, usually can be accurate. Sometimes though it's, did they have par find parking at the clinic that day? I mean, a number of things can, can play into that. And, you know, or if they just had one recurrence, but had done really well right up until then, you know, you know, it's sort of adding that quantitative side to it. So on the one hand, it gives the clinician the opportunity to actually measure, you know, the effect of a drug or a new medication, um, you know, at a, at a more granular level than just, you know, every six month clinic visits. But then also for the patient, they can see, you know, this is working, this isn't. And so some of the stuff we're doing is testing, you know, it sort of individual kind of in of one uh, medicine, if you will, where someone can try a new exposure, have a new exposure or a new treatment that and then track their recurrence or whatever the outcome is and see if it made a quantitative difference if you use statistics um, to analyze it. So um, so that's sort of what we've been doing on the patient side. Um, the physician side is really presenting that data to a physician. And, and so some of it's predictive analytics. It's saying, you know, you may not from, you know, you have your own clinical gestalt, but you may not be able to um, predict accurately, you know, how likely this person is to have some kind of bad outcome or how likely are you to get the type of results you'd want from treatment X versus treatment Y. And so again, it's more, it's sort of more quantifying a process that already is sort of taking place, but um, in a more qualitative manner. Well, and I'm thinking about how interesting would that be to combine the kind of technology the BioIntelliSense is doing with the sort of ability to very passively monitor a huge range of, of, uh, of signs and symptoms in a patient along with then the kind of work that you're doing targeting that toward a particular disease diagnosis. One of the things I'm excited about is to see as more and more of that kind of crossover happens, what sort of explosive new um, uh, breakthroughs do we see happening when this incredible device uh, is, you know, merged with this incredible new diagnostic approach, merged with this new approach for how we think about the disease and treat that patient individually? There's a lot of exciting stuff ahead. Which brings me to what I think is going to be our last sort of in-depth question here before we give a, a chance for Q&A with the audience. Um, not to end on a downer, but there is so much hype around AI ML, and we're here kind of hyping it even further. I want to ask the other question, instead of hype, can each of you give us one uncomfortable truth about AI, right? So one way in which maybe it's not living up to the hype uh, that people would benefit from, from knowing about. Um, so let's just keep going in the order we were in. David, do you want to, do you want to take a first crack at that? Oh, David, I think you might still, you might be on audio mute. All right, we're good. We're good. Yeah. And, uh, Great. I'm just kidding. Okay, so, so I, <laughs> too soon, I think. Um, no, I think, I think one of the biggest issues that was just touched upon is really um, wh whether it's getting regulatory clearance, um, whether it's seeing results that look really great before you scale, right? If you don't have that clear causal link from first principles, I mean, why is this model giving us the results it is? Um, you're going to be susceptible to biases, unknown, let's say, correlations in the data. Uh, we, we've been bitten by that a couple times, multiple times. So I think, I think it's really balancing this, this excitement, this opportunity with rigor um, and making sure that, yes, a lot of these models are a bit black box, but how do you really have that systematic kind of thought process to make sure that you've really tested and validated um, and trained appropriately. So I think I think that's the biggest risk we have where we've had these false starts sometimes in the past where it's like, oh, this is gonna be awesome, go, go, go. And it's like, oh, wait a minute, oh, we weren't detecting this, we were detecting this, or oh, 
that, you know, so I would just say it's a different level of diligence, a different type of thinking. So I'll kind of like, yeah, that's kind of yeah. Like, that makes it <laughs> yeah. And, and while you're on that vein of of the unfortunate, non-exciting, uh, hard work of of just structured, careful, good science and and regulatory approval, we do have one question here. Software as a medical device evaluation and verification is hard, and the question here is about techniques to build five ten k trials, five ten k trials, and other regulatory compliance for AI ML approvals. Do you have any advice? Um, yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole other topic. I would say, yes, it is hard. And the FDA is, um, I'd say, skeptical, right? They, 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 they look at this with a different level of just rigor because, I mean, classic thing, right? How do you train the data? And then how do you validate and test? And just making sure that you don't do any kind of, like I say, noob, you know, newbie errors where you're like, oh, yeah, I'm training with this set. Oh, I'm testing with a similar set. Oh, you know, same patient, just different times. You know, you want to just have super clear partitions of how you do those basic pieces. And then at the same time, it does help, again, what features are feeding into the model, ideally. And then why does that, just from an overall first principles perspective, directly kind of make sense and inform that? So I think I think those are the kind of pieces I would, I would certainly make sure are covered. Got it. Thank you, David. Um, let's go, since we've got Mike's connection going right now, we're going to use it. We're going to strike all of that. <laughs> Mike, one uncomfortable truth about AI. Just one? <laughs> There's a lot. Um, <laughs> I would say that there's, I've found, I found two problems. Number one, or challenges, if you will. Um, number one is the data access. And to, coming back to the sort of this idea of monitors, actually what got us into the individualized data analysis was I put, implant cardiac monitors that record, you know, thousands of pieces of information about each patient every day, include, in terms of activities, in terms of lung impedance, all these different measures. Um, getting access to commercial data or, or proprietary data is extremely challenging, and yet you sort of need to do that if you're going to have orthogonal data collection. Otherwise, you're sort of only seeing a, a piece of the picture. So um, I would say whether it's institutional data or commercial data, getting data access is, is a huge challenge um, for these. And then the second thing I would lead into is you still can't escape epidemiology. And I think that's a big problem. And, and particularly for some of these um, types of uh, applications that you hear about where people are hoping to identify a rare event. Well, if you're going to train a model on a rare event, you need a lot of information. You need a lot of enough of those events for it to happen. And so, you know, we run into this in the rare variant, you know, world of genetic analysis that it's really hard when you have something that's extremely uncommon to get enough information to even train a model to identify that in the first place. So, you know, in addition to all the bi population bias and everything else that you encounter, I think those two are, are the things that I, I think about or sort of keep me up about, is this even going to work? Or can we even get the data in the place it needs to in the first place? And even if we have everything perfect, is there even enough information to train the model to find the, the scary things that we want it to, to find? Yeah, that's great. So, so getting the data, wrangling the data. I mean, I think that's the that's a refrain from everybody who who wears the data scientist badge. Is they're like training the models is easy once you get me the data, and once I can get the data into a form that that actually works. And and that actually uh, fits really nicely with another another question here from the audience, which I'll open to any of you who want to answer because I think it applies in in different ways. And then Riley, we're going to get to the uncomfortable truth question with you. Um, what are techniques for doing real world data capture and evidence? for AIML that's different from existing systems, right? So if getting the data is hard, what do people need to be prepared for when they're gonna embark on going and, and, and how do they need to think about data acquisition differently from, um, from how we currently do? Anybody wanna jump in? And generate your data, the, the data yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think it, We've used a lot of meta-analyses to help with this problem and just learn. It's really about understanding the relationship between data. You can start imputing one data from type from the other. Um, and then using meta-analyses just to constrain and ensure as long as you have a clean enough representative uh, validation set, uh, you can really ensure that test and validation are being done in a way that's diligent and can, you know, consistently observed in multiple different databases, even if you know there's not one large one. Um, so it really is kind of designing how you can use data in an effective way um, or you know, doing a lot of data generation yourself. Got it. I think that's a great answer. Um, David, Mike, anything you'd add to that? Uh, make friends with people who have access to data. <laughs> <laughs> <a good> one. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I, it is probably an area, honestly, that would warrant its own discussion, right? Um, where do you get the data? How do you wrangle it? Sometimes the answer is not actually as, as hard as it seems. Um, there are There's a tremendous amount of public data out there available for all kinds of sources. And I frequently have people in my line of work who are coming to me and, and asking, how, how do they get to that? Gosh, it would sure be great if I could get to this. And the reality is that in many cases, the data is out there. There might be a little frictional barrier to entry, something you got to sign up, a system you got to learn to use, an application you have to fill out, but it's but it's there, right? And I think an interesting challenge for the industry would be if we could come together somehow and create that sort of comprehensive uh, database or directory of what data exists and what does it take to get it. So not necessarily talking about putting it all in one place, but even helping people understand what it is that they need. David, you mentioned, for example, that some of the, the metadata that you guys might work with around those sensors is what's the ambient air temperature in the zip code today. That's interesting metadata that's out there that not everybody would know how to go and find that. And once they've got it, how to ingest it and use it. So I think, you know, not a great answer for the person who's asking the question because we're basically saying it's hard to generate the data yourself if you can, but there might be things that we could do in a whole other panel discussion on how do we actually lower that bar in order to accelerate some of these transformations. All right, so Riley, then back to you on the uncomfortable truth question. What's the hard truth that people really need to know about AI today? Yeah, so I definitely want to echo the, the confounder uh, and it's just some of the issues with data types. Um, so I, I don't want to, I think the other one that we face, which is very challenging, is just a reality that a lot of the methods, especially around image data or, any, or even just sequence and, and, and NLP in general, um, but a lot of the data types and the methods that have been able to, I think, leverage uh, our knowledge of how those data operate and what um, really works well for generalizing and what the drawbacks are, just don't apply to biological data. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about some of the highest dimensional, incredibly sparse and heterogeneous and tiny data sets. It's, it's like the worst and most challenging uh, problem to face. Um, and then the data just uh, looking at distribution in general are quite unique. Um, so a lot of the methods we have just don't apply. They don't work. Um, and you can be fooled and assume they work. That's usually go back to the first issue of the confounders. Um, but I think what we've found is it's taken a lot more of our computational biologists, our clinical scientists, our bioinformatic folks, as well as the machine learning engineers and machine learning scientists to work really closely together and to have a company culture where people, we can be patient because this is a long, long-term um, effort. Uh, because what we're starting to see is that without understanding these biological networks and encoding those as priors or just really building architectures that reflect the biology, which first of all, we don't understand, um, becomes even more difficult to have that rapid iteration. Um, so I think giving the scientists and the engineers the, the space and the patience so that they can do the research well um, is critical. And that's why it's really picking a problem where machine learning is not needed to solve the problem. You can still solve the problem without machine learning but it gets your foot in the door to the data or to the clinical relationships and regulatory relationships that you can then overlay machine learning at the right time when it's ready. Um, and I think that that approach is just very important. So we don't rush a lot of these machine learning systems out and then we have all these mistakes and problems, um, but really just taking that a grounded approach and prioritizing problems that can be solved with more traditional linear methods um, and, and then building towards that longer term. So I think the, the biggest challenge we've had is just for biological data, there's just nothing. I mean, at a lot of the conferences we go to, the research conferences, there's like two posters looking at biological data because it's huh. so messy and challenging. Huh. So there's just a lot of research that needs to be done uh, for us to apply this to bio biological data. Um, you guys, those are fantastic answers to that to that question. I got to say, I was really curious about where you would find the pitfalls, and and you know, there, there's overlap and common themes in those. And I hope that folks um, listening uh, were able to p pick up something, maybe something that you're already dealing with, or maybe something that you can give some thought to. Um, I, we have just like a couple minutes left, and so this is actually going to be the last question, and it's quick answer, um, it, and, and hopefully a little bit fun. Uh, once upon a time in health technology and biotech, it was a big deal to be computerized, right? And we had conferences talking about how we're going to computerize healthcare. And then it was a big deal 
once upon a time for things to be mobile. And there were conferences he would go to and all that they were talking about was, hey, we can let your clinicians do the work that they want to do on this iPad or this tablet, or they can, you can get patient reported outcomes from apps and that you were mobile was a big deal. And we do not talk about those things anymore because they're just the foundation on which we're, what we're building the next, um, uh, the next innovation. So I guess my question is, uh, do you think that we're going to get to the point where it's no longer special to have an AI driven product in the healthcare or biotech space? When do you think that's going to be? David, you're first. Um, certainly. So I think the answer is, uh, yeah, absolutely. When will it be? I think is that just dependent on what the use case is and what the overall, I, I think like if you look at kind of like a spectrum, like Riley's problem set is extremely complex, difficult, and a lot of research. I'd say the problem set that we're dealing with is far more um, direct and intuitive, right? It's just a lot of data sensors, wearables, fit. I mean, they're all over the place and you're just gathering this stuff. So, so I think it's gonna be kind of a crawl, walk, run, right? As Riley was saying as well, it's like there are certain things where yes, we have solutions that are more linear, that are more kind of this classic algorithms approach. And, and then we say, okay, well, we can take those same kind of inputs, but then run it, it's like, wow, you get a lift, right? And then and that, that kind of incremental confidence building and sequencing uh, makes a lot of sense. So, so from my perspective, we're going to start embarking on this journey where I would say, you know, using this and wearables and that whole, it's already started for us, but we're kind of at the tip of the spear. And yeah, I think probably, you know, a couple of years to diffuse. I don't know if it's two, three or four. Certainly COVID is a massive catalyst yeah. for a lot of these types of technology. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question directly or not, Michael, but I'd say uh, it just kind of depends and it's, it's already happening. Um, it will happen more and more quickly, I think, as confidence, comfort um, and methodologies are, are matured. Shahid, do we have time for Mike and Riley to give their 30 second answers? We do, uh, but let me just, as you guys finish that up, I remember, uh, Michael, you'll be taking over the uh, SADA uh, solutions area uh, booth. Uh, so as soon as people leave here, uh, remember, you can go there to uh, join Michael and team on the SADA booth or see or talk, uh, listen to what the NIH is going to talk about with what their MIDRC tool. Uh, but do finish up here. And uh, we'll, I just wanted to let the audience know that the other session will be starting uh, as they're finishing up. Great, thank you so much, Shahid. Uh, Riley, 30 seconds. When does AI stop being cool? <laughs> I mean, so I, I was thinking about this. The moment, hum I think human loop and a lot of decisions being made in healthcare have some AI ML component, like that's the big tipping point. And the reality is we, I mean, people still want to use faxes. We're still struggling with EHRs. Like we, we've got a long way to go. Um, but the more people can make decisions with a, an additional uh, data point coming from AIML, I think that's going to be a big tipping point. Um, and it's going to take time to, you know, depending on the complexity of the decision. Um, but I do think that that's what we should be looking for um, as we start seeing uh, the human in the loop becoming more of a common theme um, for just clinical decision making. Got it. Thanks, Mike. Or thanks, <laughs> Riley. Mike, take us out. Yeah, I uh, a long ways actually. I, I think we're still a very long way actually. From I, 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 you saw this with genetic information, people thought it was going to change medicine, and even now we're just sort of figuring out ways to use all that data. And that was twenty years ago at least. So um, I think in our I'll be surprised in our lifetime if it's if we're you know in the Star Trek era of you know relying on computers to make diagnoses and things. I just think it's much more complicated. There's things we're probably going to find that we took for granted or, or, you know, don't understand, so. Um, thanks, Mike. So honestly, the, the consensus here is somewhere between two and three years and our lifetimes. <laughs> we're gonna be, we're gonna get bored talking about AI. Now. I was not bored today. Thank you very, very much, all three of you for your time, for your input and your insights. Um, for folks still on the line, uh, I, I'll be in the, the SADA virtual booth for an hour. And if you are interested, and guys, I hope you don't mind if, if, if there's something that you're doing or some way that you want to collaborate or, or reach out or get in touch with these, these three, let me know and I can help to facilitate those, um, those introductions. Uh, again, thanks everybody for, for coming and attending. Hopefully it was used to you. Thank, you. thank Thank you again, our three outstanding panelists. And I look forward to doing this again with you guys sometime soon. Yeah, thanks. Next time I'll have a better connection. <laughs> <laughs> we got there, Mike. No worries. Okay.